Hello and welcome to our webinar. It's about Penn State's best practices for being the campus-wide point person for research support. Not an easy job, typically. But in this video, our friends from Penn State will share best practices for campus-wide outreach and centralized research support. Our presenters will discuss how having everything centralized reduces faculty burden and it makes training and support a breeze. So join us now as our webinar with Penn State is about to begin. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Carlos Mancata, Director of Client Services at InfoReady. Thanks for taking the time to join us today for today's Peer Spotlight webinar featuring our, our guest panelists from Penn State University, Michelle Hutnick and Jill Self. Pronounced Self, not Selfie, if you were wondering. Uh, and to the panelists today uh, will be sharing their best practices for managing and organizing uh, centralized research support and uh, how, how they work with a broad range of stakeholders at their institution. Uh, they're they're going to uh, be able to provide details of, uh, about all the different uses, processes, stakeholders actually work with a wide range of campuses in the Penn State system, so you'll be able to hear lots now uh, with the logistics covered. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists from Penn State, Michelle Hutnick and Jill Self. Uh, take it away, ladies. Hello, so this is Michelle. I'll be starting off and we'll be going back and forth. So a brief outline of what we're gonna discuss today is we are Penn State. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves, a little bit about Penn State, our office, and following it with how we promote and support InfoReady review um, across our campus and the different future plans that we have. So next slide, please. So this is me, I'm Michelle Hutnick. I am the Director of Research Analytics and Communications in the Vice President for Research Office. I actually went to Penn State myself for my undergraduate degree. I joined um, the Vice President for Research Office in 2015. My responsibilities include uh, formalizing and identifying, showcasing Penn State's research strengths and, strengths and performances. Um, limited submissions is just one of the things that I do um, kind of on the side for me. Next slide, please. Hi, and I'm Jill Self. I'm the Administrator Coordinator. I actually went to Robert Morris University outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I joined the Penn State's uh, Vice President for Research Office in May of 2017, and my responsibilities include the limited submissions. Um, I also support the Associate Vice President and the Director of Industrial Partnership and the Associate uh, CIO for Research. Next slide, please. So this is Penn State at a glance. So Penn State is a big university. We have almost 100,000 students and we have more than 5,000 researchers. Our office manages limited submissions for external opportunities centrally for all of Penn State, except for the College of Medicine um, in some cases. They manage their own, but they are transitioning to use InfoReady for even those ones. Next slide, please. So for some perspective on um, our research enterprise, we actually, this last year, hit um, our research expenditures hit a record of 927 million last year. So we are uh, really happy with the trend that we're seeing lately. Next slide, please. So the limited submissions office at Penn State, that's really just a few of us. Um, so our vice president for research is Neil Sharkey. He is going to be retiring as of September 1st. I have to say that he's been extremely supportive of the use of InfoReady Review at Penn State um, and its promotion. So the limited submissions program by policy fall under the Associate Vice President for Research for Strategic Initiatives, who is Shashank Priya. Um, the bulk of the administration of the program is handled by me and by Jill, and I would also probably say the bulk of everything that we do together is handled by Jill. Um, limited submissions cover about 50% of her time, and it's uh, less of the time that, uh, of my time, less than 50%. Kimberly Ducato, who is an administrative support assistant, is starting to help us 
um, with limited submissions in our office. Next slide, please. So the use of InfoReady Review at Penn State. So sometimes you might hear me say InfoReady um, instead of the whole InfoReady Review, um, but because in the past for us, we've always just called it InfoReady. But we've had it now for almost three years. We got it in December of 2016. Um, the primary, primary reason why we obtained the platform was to manage our limited submission, submissions for external opportunities. We centrally manage all limited submissions across all of Penn State, all of the other campuses, um, except for, of course, the College of Medicine. So we started off with four microsites, and we've added a fifth. So you can see them here. There's one for our site. There's seed grants. Um, that's for internal competitions at Penn State. Foundation relations, that's uh, where they post the open opportunities, the limited submission foundation uh, grants actually are covered by our office. Um, undergraduate research and then the graduate school. So undergraduate research was our earliest adopter and I'd say that it that office has been instrumental in uh, seeing the possible use, uses for InfraReady. Next slide, please. So our overall usage, we downloaded these numbers last week and we were quite surprised ourselves. Um, this is the usage of all five microsites since December of 2000, um, actually 19 of 2016. Um, when we have it. So this is the re results over almost three years. So we've had over 7,500 users. This includes faculty, staff, undergraduate, and graduate students. We've posted more than 600 competitions or open posts. Uh, we've had almost 6,000 applications coming in um, and four, more than 1,400 reviewers. We have 29 administrators, and I have an asterisk there because Carlos plays a very active role in reminding me about how many review uh, administrators we have and um, trying to make sure we stick to our numbers. We keep him busy for that. Um, next slide, please. So the current usages, um, so again, it's for limited submission, uh, we cover both um, the eight federal agencies and foundations in our office. Seed funding um, is actually the strategic plan, seed funding, institutes and centers, campuses and colleges, global partnerships, um, fellowships, travel grants, those are parts that are covered by um, our uh, undergraduate and graduate research. So I would say that the undergraduate research initially used um, InfraReady for two grant competitions and it now uses it for over 20 different types of competitions and applications. So our undergraduate and graduate school uses include fellowships, grants, um, awards, judging registration, manuscript submissions, program evaluations, poster exhibits, all sorts of different things. Um, and one thing that we have now is that we have so many use cases that we need to focus on uh, that we all use it consistently. Next slide, please. And so some of the best practices for, for managing the internal competitions, our overall goal is to, to decrease administration and faculty burden, but more importantly, run the best competition possible. For the uh, templates, we, whenever we build the competitions, we like to make sure we are including the same information, which is um, summary of the announcement, award information, internal nomination process. Uh, we try to keep what we are asking the applicant to provide and how to provide it relatively the same. So, uh, so we asked for a cover page to include the proposal title, the PI, co-PI names and departments, their participating organizations, if applicable, uh, project description is limited to two pages. We also asked for a two-page bio sketch for all PIs and co-PIs. Um, we also keep the formatting guidelines the same for all competitions. 
And we also ask the applicant to include the name of their associate dean for research and their research administration, which surprisingly um, can be comical sometimes what they fill out. <laughs> we also require them to name um, a Penn State subject matter expert who could review applications uh, and the name of those reviewers not to include, for example, due to a conflict of interest. Um, and we also um, ask the applicants to explicitly answer application requirements. Um, for the review process, we keep the rating scale the same with one being the, the highest, and the reviewer comments are confidential and anonymous. And we also clean up um, the reviewer comments uh, before we send them out. Um, we also use InfoReady's email notifications for the winners. And we also copy their associate dean for research, their research administrator, their college, and, and ourselves. N next slide, please. So how do we support the different administrators? Um, it's all about the workflow. So the first thing we always ask if somebody is interested or planning on using InfoReady is if they have ever, used, ever run a competition before. Um, and if no, we demonstrate how it can be done and encourage them to test out different scenarios using our test site. If the answer is yes, that they have done a competition before, then we always first ask is, does the competition have to be done the way that they currently do it? Because sometimes that, or often that's not the case. So when we're establishing a workflow um, for new users, we, we, have, uh, we share with them our templates. So frequently, um, it, this is key for the, for the new people coming on. They can be reused or adapted um, for other competitions. We always talk about how to create a timeline working backwards from the organizational deadline, the promotion and distribution of the competition, um, who do you send it to? So for limited submissions, we do not send them directly to the faculty. We send them to two different listservs, primarily the research deans and the research administrators. And this, this, this listserv goes all out to Penn State and then they send it to their faculty. Um, other, uh, other competitions or sites may have their own list serves to promote their competitions. We talk about the review process, um, how it can be done and how it shouldn't be done. So one thing that we have discovered is that we really need to help people set up um, all the different processes to really uh, utilize all the functionality of InfoReady. Um, so for example, if you have a person fill out an Excel spreadsheet as part of the review process, that's, uh, that, that's not probably uh, not the best way to go. Um, and then the communications, we always encourage um, the, when people are setting up competitions to be consistent and proactive with the communications. Um, I would say that as far as the follow-up goes and using um, the tracking, our office, uh, we don't use that functionality as much as we should. I know that, that we do have seed grants that do it. Um, and I will admit that having a test site is, has been key to um, expanding our use of InfraReady because people can really go in and set up different scenarios and test them out before they launch a, a competition. So that's been very helpful. Next slide, please. So here are some of the uh, tips, tricks, and lessons learned um, from being a point person for InfoRight Reveal. Um, we tried to streamline the limited submission process to make it easier for faculty and staff using InfoReady. Uh, we base our process on the theme that surprises uh, are not good in limited submission competitions. Um, some of the information that we have streamlined, our InfraReady website and our own research website here, uh, we post our internal winners on our research website. This gives the research administrators and Office of Sponsored Programs a place to look to see if we ran a competition, and if so, was there a winner, and if so, who won? The aim is to give research administrators a heads up for proposal development. Um, also, faculty who may be interested in submitting a proposal but miss the internal competition deadline, 
they can see if a competition was held and if there was an internal nominee. Um, we like to uh, keep the consistent communication. Um, every competition is emailed from our limited submission email account. So what we do is we send the, the infrared email to our limited subs email, and then we forward it out um, from our limited submission account. So we keep the email subject line the same with every email. The header is always in caps, labeled limited submission. The name of the competition, including the FOA number and the internal submission deadline date. The competition language and application requirements are standard and included in the body of the email. Um, for, for the calendar, um, for the timeline, we, uh, we like to work backwards from the organizational deadline. We like to post the competition six to eight weeks prior, uh, keep the competition open for two weeks, and give the reviewers a week. That gives the researcher enough time to work on their proposal, which is most important. Uh, for template revisions, this is key on how we run our competitions. We revise at the start and at the close of each competition. At the start, we look to see if there are any updates in the new solicitation. Then at the end of the competition, we basically create next year's competition and include all the details that we wish we had included this round. Um, for example, example, if there's confusing language or if we need to ask specific questions uh, uh, pertaining to that competition. Um, for help desk, for our one-on-one -on -one customer support, uh, we do make sure that our phone number is on the, the InfraReady webpage, on our research webpage, and we include an email signature line on every email that's sent out uh, through the limited sub email address. Uh, and we try to answer every question that arises. Um, if we cannot answer, we do give them the email address to the InfraReady support, which is wonderful customer service, and always uh, the response time is, is a pretty quick turnaround time. Um, there are times when we do provide one-on-one -on -one training for administrators, reviewers, and applicants. Uh, we also direct them to the uh, online how-to guides uh, that InfraReady has. They are uh, extremely uh, helpful um, and they do provide excellent step-by-step -step instructions. Um, for people that aren't real computer savvy, we do, and we do have them. <laughs> uh, for example, for some reviewers, we used to download proposals and email them in a PDF to review, um, but with InfoReady, um, you know, not so much anymore. Next slide. So basically our future plans is because of the expanded usage of uh, InfoReady review at Penn State, we'd like to uh, create an um, administrator user group. And it's to share with each other our best practices um, and to ensure that we all use consistent um, usage of the different features. Uh, we also would like to um, take advantage of the progress reporting, which I think is something that we underutilize right now. And also so that we all can think together about how we can expand uh, the use of uh, infrared review across Penn State. It's a, for us, it's, um, it has been uh, reduced a lot of administrative burden um, for our office, and I think it can be helpful in other places too. Next slide, please. So, and finally, what we've been doing is uh, Penn State has been um, integrating InfraReady Review and InfraReady Scale, which I think has a great uh, potential for us. And uh, this is kind of just a little bit of a preview of what's going to be coming next for um, from our office. Next slide. So that's all. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michelle and Jill. Uh, I think that was very helpful, and, and we've received quite a few questions. So uh, let's jump into the Q&A portion. Uh, by, by the way, uh, we put Michelle and Jill's contact information on screen here uh, in, in case you'd like to reach out as well. Uh, so jumping here into the questions, uh, we received some uh, during uh, the presentation, but we also received some ahead of time when you were registering for the webinar. 
So we'll get into all of those right now. Um, and uh, let's let's get started. So uh, you this, this relates to something you you covered before. Um, someone asked, "How many staff members uh, is your office composed of, and how many interact with what you do with InfoReady?" So our staff, um, it's primarily Jill and myself. However, it's only part of both of us. So Jill, it's 50%. Me, it's probably closer to a third of what I do, depending on the time of year. And we, we're bringing on one more person, um, Kimberly, coming in, who will be helping out. But she won't be doing it 100% either. So um, it's a pretty, we're a pretty lean um, operation. But organized. Yeah, um, which we have to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a question here uh, that asked, um, you know, did you face any resistance to change when you were implementing the system? And how did yes, you deal with it? We did have, um, and we still do have people who, um, are resistant to change. And I think um, it's just something that what, what we try to do is just talk of, show people how easy it is to use and how easy it is to set up a competition. Um, that's number, that's one of the first things that we do. And the second thing is that we do talk to people about how it's good for um, Penn State and our faculty. If, if everybody is kind of using the same site and going to the same place, doing the same thing, um, it actually makes it easier across the board. So we we try to let them know that they're not asking their faculty to use something new. Their faculty is most likely already using it. So those are kind of the two ways that we we um, try to overcome resistance. Thanks, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> this other question is, in the same vein, uh, could you describe some of the specific challenges you face and what solutions you implemented to address that, those challenges when implementing a central solution? So I think that um, what's key is that, well, first of all, that Jill and I know this system quite well. Um, and I, so I think that's where one place to start is basically that you have to have somebody internally who knows how to use it. Um, I think that it's also great that we also know that um, uh, the people who, if, if we have questions that we can't answer, that the InfoReady support is excellent. Um, I actually still go back and use the videos all the time to see how, um, how to do different things. So I, I think it's, um, you know, we do hand holding um, if we have to. And um, we do listen to all the complaints that we receive too, because there, sometimes we get those too. Um, and, we, and we really try to um, adjust our approach if um, based on the different comments we get from people. So we, we are we try to be consistent, but we also try to be flexible um, and responsive to our uh, I would say consumers. Thanks, uh, Michelle. Um, here's a, another related question that was submitted uh, in advance. Uh, how user friendly have you found the system to be? for reviewers who are not computer savvy. And I know you kind of touched on that uh, when you were speaking before. Um, and then related to that, what has been the feedback from external applicants versus internal applicants with regard to ease of applying? So for um, reviewers who are not computer savvy, we also have applicants who are not computer savvy and we have administrators who aren't computer savvy. Um, it, it literally, you 
you do what you can to make it work. Um, you know, for example, if we have a reviewer who just refuses to go into the system, and at the very beginning we may have had one or two of those, we don't anymore. Um, we would um, download the applications um, and then upload their review comments um, and help with the kind of do things by proxy. We we aren't in that position anymore. We haven't had anybody ask for help like that because it really is once they start using it, um, it they discover it's very easy to use. Um, so I think I did I forget any of the answer or I think that oh, covered it pretty well. As far as external users um, or reviewers or applicants, um, that's not something that we, because uh, we do, you know, internal competitions for external um, applications. So we don't have experience with that, but I do know that there are other microsites that have um, used it. And um, what I would probably do is, if I had any questions, I would I would go to them and ask them how it's been for them. Um, but I have not, um, sometimes it's no news is good news. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I agree. Sometimes no news is good news. Uh, since, since you brought microsites up, we do have a few microsite related questions. Uh, one of them is, could you expand on how microsites have helped your process? Well, so first of all, um, for microsites, we have, I think when you're having students who are also using the pro, um, the platform, it's it's a good idea. You know, we have under, we have a microsite for undergraduate research, so the undergrads go there. We have a microsite for graduate students, so the graduate school. Um, and then we have the other sites, which are much more staff and uh, faculty targeted. So I think right right there we have different um, audiences, and it's kind of good to have those different um, the just different competitions in different places along those lines. I think that it, it makes it. Um, uh, I think it like we have people who are kind of in charge of their microsite. So we kind of interact with those people who are in charge of the uh, microsite sites uh, quite a bit, um, but we may not have one-on-one um, -on -one inter interactions with all the different um, uh, the, the administrators. So those those people who lead the microsites are kind of the in between. Thank you, Michelle. And, and here's another microsite question we received. Uh, uh, and I, I think you probably covered a little bit of it. Um, how do you determine if you can make a unit a microsite? Is it based on the number of grant opportunities related to the unit? Um, I, I think you kind of mentioned it was based off of audience. Uh, I'll, I'll just let, let you go from there. So for us, it was basically audience, um, and it's. Uh, yeah, I think with the break up breakdown is by audience. We actually have changed the names of our microsites over time, um, also, but um, it's primarily right now by audience. Thank you, Michelle. Um, now. We, we actually have had several questions about test sites, and, and uh, I can answer part of it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll let Michelle and Jill expand on the other part. Um, so one of the questions about test sites is, how do we set up a test site? Uh, if you want to set up a test site, InfraReady will be glad to work with you. So uh, the people who who asked to know more, uh, will reach out to you after the webinar to discuss that. Um, the other questions about test sites uh, relate more to when, when do you feel comfortable with something moving from the test site to uh, the live site? Um. So 
I'm actually quite comfortable with things moving from the test site to the live site. It seems like the, for the people who are new to running competitions um, get a little nervous when things go live. I can say that for Jill and I, we are not, um, we don't get nervous about those sort of things anymore. Um, so, and if, you know, we have a test competition that shows up on our live site, um, it's not like anybody can apply for it. So um, we just, we aren't nervous about it. It just sometimes can, we have to be encouraging to the other people. I think that answers it. I, I think so too. Um, here's, another, here's one pertaining to uh, more being that central point of contact for administrators on campus. Uh, do the research administrators have a hierarchy for administrative viewing and role? And how, how do you determine that? So you. Um, can you repeat that? So you mean research administration or? I, I mean, think they, they mean the administrators in the system. Or can I clarify? So. I, I think it's a permission. How do you determine when you create an administrator, how do you determine the permissions you're going to give them? Um, I always start with the lowest level of per, um, permission, which is just a, being a regular administrator. Um, I haven't actually had anybody ask for a higher level. So we have people who are administrators for their site. Um, and then they tend to be the people who really know info ready well. And then we have um, administrators for competitions. So that's kind of how we we have a lot of people who are um, have their administrative rights turned on and off frequently because of um, just trying to keep that number down below 29. Thank you. Um, so we have a few limited submission questions here. So as you can kind of see, I'm going based off of topics, that way we cover uh, everything. Uh, so regarding the limited submission email address suggestion, uh, do you also have a limited submission InfraReady administrator account? Uh, yes, we do, but um, we, we do have that account. But I would say that most people just go to limited subs or they just uh, contact me directly. Um, we do have that account. It's just uh, by now a lot of people just know it's Jill or me. Um, so we do get a direct emails and we have no problem with answering direct emails. Um, so, so another limited submission question, uh, how do you learn about those funding opportunities. So what, what's your process for that? So we actually um, have access to a platform funding institutional. Um, so that's a grant um, database that we look at. Uh, we look at our own calendar and see what we ran last year. Um, and then we look at each other's limited submission sites. So Jill and I spend time looking at other university sites to see if we missed something, um, and then we post it. The, I'd say the biggest issue sometimes is for foundations, is if it's by invitation only, tracking down if Penn State got an um, invitation, where did it go, and um, making sure that those invitations arrive at the right office. Thank you. Uh, so, so when when you're working, here's another limited submission question, but it, it, it it's in regards to collaborating with other departments. So, uh, do you, what's your process uh, with other departments across the institution regarding nominations and limited submissions? 
in terms of coordinating and getting on the same page. So, for example, if we have a limited submission that, um, let's say, like an NSF one that has, um, you know, each college can submit two applications. Um, we collect all of the applications centrally, and then we send them back to the college and let them decide uh, who is going to, um, you know, uh, win for their college. We also have, you know, so as far as nominations go, we like to have the the, uh, the faculty member or the applicant be the person who um, submits you know, too info ready, we don't do it by, you know, we don't have, let's say a nominator nominate somebody. Um, but we do, you know, use the letter of recommendation or make sure that, you know, the person acknowledges who has nominated them. But it's, it's typically if, you know, a faculty member has been nominated, they, um, it's their account, you know, they're the ones who create their account and their, um, you know, their application. Thank you. One, one last question related to limited submissions and, and communication. Uh, do you use InfoReady Review or have you thought about configuring InfoReady Review uh, to announce limited submissions uh, to the listserv? Um, so what we do is we, we have um, thought about that. Sometimes uh, our email system puts things in um, the junk email. So uh, we keep it consistently and sometimes um, those emails go there. So we, we like having everything sent from our email address. So what we do is we just send it to us and then we send it out from there. It's pretty important since we don't send our announcements uh, straight to faculty that we, um, people can recognize that it's coming from us and they can forward it. So I, I think I've exhausted the limited submission questions. I just wanted to group all those together. Uh, we have another question related to and standardizing processes and, and keeping up to date with them. Uh, so here's the quote. Uh, you mentioned that at the end of the competition, you revise the template based on your experience in the current cycle. Do you make the changes to current template and save it for next cycle, or do you have one template per competition uh, that you use? Uh, if not, how many kinds of templates do you have? Um, so we so we have it's kind of like we have t a master template, but then we also have the competition templates. So we actually have a template for each of the um, competitions. So for example, the NSF MRI, we we have a template for that, and it's uh, you know so we, we make adjustments to this year's, and we um, that becomes next year's template. We also have um, you know, a general template where we create all the new templates from. And that includes some of the standard questions that we ask on all of the limited submissions or competitions. Like, who is your research team? Um, can be very entertaining, those answers. But we, we have, so we have, we have both. I'm, I'm sure you, you chuckle to yourself every once in a while. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more question related to standardization. Uh, uh, one item that's part of your process is, is a cover page. So for your cover page, is that a standardized uploaded document, or do you use text boxes uh, and, and other uh, form fields? within InfraReady Review um, for applicant and proposal requirements? Uh, we do not have a, um, a form that they need to upload, and we, we just have a request that they format it the same way. 
but we, we don't have a form for them to fill out. Uh, um, they probably wouldn't use it if we did, or it might be used 50% of the time. So um, we don't require something like that. Maybe other people have better luck with things like that, but we don't. Thank, thank you. And, and now we actually have a few questions related to uh, some reviewer management. Um, so here's a question. Um, when you say clean up reviewer comments, what do you mean? Clean up typos or is it something else? Oh, yes, it could be typos. It could be somebody writing something like, I liked applicant number one better than number two. Um, we can't have things like that <laughs> included. Um, so it it would be, you know, yes, we do clean up typos. We correct um, things like that. But it's, you know, the, re the reviewer comments, um, you know, they need to be helpful to the applicant. Um, and they shouldn't identify any of the other applications and they should identify the reviewer. Thank you. Um, no, uh, another question about uh, reviewers is uh, what's the time frame for your review process? So, how do you plan um, that? So, first of all, we, we have to send out emails. To um, to invite people to review, um, that goes out first, and we ask them to respond by a certain time. Um, we try to give them, you know, somewhere between one week and two weeks to review. Um, it doesn't really. Um, we rarely get reviews earlier than the night before. So we haven't really found that they're requiring, you know, a three-week review process. Um, one week seems to be um, pretty good, and and we can also be quite flexible with our. We try to be reflex, flexible with when our review due dates are. So if somebody says yes, I can, but I can't do it till next Monday, um, we accommodate them if at all possible. But but giving them three weeks to review, what we end up with is you know, getting all the reviews in the last two or three days, regardless if it's three weeks or one week. So uh, it sounds like human nature always always has to do it the night before, whether you're a student or, or a reviewer. Well, they're very busy people, so um, we just appreciate the fact that they do it, but it's it's on their to-do list, and it's, if it's due tomorrow, they'll do it today. Uh, so here's another question related to that. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, keep up with reviewers after uh, they've done reviews? Is there some sort of thank you? Uh, or or anything like that. Yes, we always um, we always thank them at the end of a review. Um, that's kind of like one of the best practices. We do thank them for reviewing, and then we let them know um, the results of the competition because they did participate in it. Um, so we always do thank them. Individually. Oh, it's just always nice to have it personalized. Uh, and now, there's, we have a question that's uh, related to after the review process. Uh, how how do you handle uh, making the award decisions in the system? Um, you mean like in the actual? System itself, oh, we click I, on the I, I'm award button. <laughs> the, the question is more: How? What's the process of taking the reviews 
and and making a final determination on it. And then uh, so, ba so basically, oh. we we do have a scoring. Um, so we we take the the people who have the highest scores. You know, we you, you know they, and then we also include the the comments. Um, and it is ultimately up to either the vice president for research or the associate vice president for research to um, review the reviewers scores and comments and make the decision um, who it goes to. Thank you. Uh, so there, there's a question here uh, about you know, interacting and managing uh, the reviewers uh, service. Do you provide any incentives to reviewers? Uh, also, does being a reviewer count towards service requirements? Uh, as you know, related to the faculty contract. So we are currently in the process of um, trying to establish a new review policy as far as who the reviewers are. Um, no, there currently is not any incentives for uh, people to be reviewers. We we currently, by our policy, are required to ask um, research deans and institute directors first. Uh, we are um, in the process of working to establish reviewer panels that will be recognized as university service. Um, it, it'll be a big undertaking, but it is definitely um, a path that we are planning on um, going towards. Thank, thank you. Uh, We have a couple microsite administrator questions that just came in. Uh, so regard, with regard to microsite and site administrators, uh, how do you determine how many administrators will be assigned to each microsite? Um, so basically each microsite should have one you know, site administrator, and they all do. Um, when we start having problems with having too many administrators, I'll send out an email. Um, and if people are not actively administering a competition, um, I change their status from administrator to applicant. And then when they need to be an uh, administrator again, then they get changed back. Um, so we have a lot of changes going on, but that's, um, you know, so nobody except for the site, um, the people who lead the microsites, nobody gets full-time um, administrative uh, designation because we have so many different people using it. Uh Thanks. Thanks for sharing that information about hand, uh, how how the administrators are handled. I think that will provide clarity for some folks on the phone. Uh, here is a question that might need some clarity. Do you use InfraReady Review for research assignment and research leave? Um. I'm not quite sure what they mean by research assignment or research leave. Um, if that would mean using it for, let's say, a sabbatical. Um, I, I think it's I think it's along the lines of sabbatical, but uh, let's go with that assumption. But if the person who asked that uh, could could uh, clarify, that would be great. I'll just submit that in the chat. I mean, so that that would be something that is done in the colleges. Um, do I think that that InfoReady could be used for something like that? Uh, yes, I do. Um, that would not be something our office would handle. Um, that would be something done by the college offices. But we do have, um, you know, that that sort of registration. Um, you know, uh, it's not really a competition, but that sort of 
registra registration posting, um, we do use InfoReady for that already. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you uh, for for that reply, Michelle. I know that was a little ambiguous, and we went with an assumption. Thank you. Um, we're down to our last question here, and uh, it says, "Tell us more about why you are not using the system to track your uh, projects and progress reports." Um. We uh, intend to use it, and there are some uh, definitely seed grants that do. We just have not um, had enough time to um, start having you know that be a part of our workflow. Um, our, we actually are not part of sponsored programs, so a lot of times things, when they're past our office, um, they go into sponsored programs. But it is something that we intend to um, learn more about and integrate into our workflow process. But we, we aren't part of sponsored programs, so when a, a proposal comes in, um, as, as um, currently we do do some follow-up, but um, not a lot coming out of our office, which um, is likely to be changing. And we won't ask you to elaborate on that because I'm sure the details aren't fully fleshed out yet. Correct. <laughs> so uh, that was the last question. So if anyone else has any questions, uh, we only have a few minutes left and we'd be glad to get those in. Okay, we just got a question. So uh, how does your foundation relations utilize the site? So our foundation relations, um, the way we currently have things set up is that they have it for open postings. So it's in some ways to bring um, awareness for open foundation opportunities and they can contact the foundation um, people and get their support for applying for those. So I think that that's um, how they use it for an open site. For the limited submit, um, for the foundation opportunities that are limited submissions, we post that on ours. Um, the way it is at Penn State is that the limited submissions, um, you know, for research grants fall under the Vice President for Research uh, responsibility. So we we work with those um, app or those foundation opportunities that are limited, we work with them the foundation relations people, but they're posted on our site because they're a limited submission for an external um, opportunity. But we work with the foundation people. Um, Michelle, Jill, thank you very much for your time. I, I think uh, a lot, lots of good conversation here, lot, lots of good questions. Thank you uh, for all of your answers there and providing clarity uh, and, and ideas to some folks.